Hello, and welcome to all of you, whether you're tuning in from Rome, Copenhagen, Washington, D.C., or somewhere else in the world. My name is Tom Pesek. I'm Senior Liaison Officer at the FAO Office for North America, based in Washington, D.C., and I will be serving as moderator for our event today. On behalf of FAO North America and the Embassy of Denmark in Washington, D.C., I would like to thank all of you for joining this timely webinar on preventing a crisis within a crisis, combating antimicrobial resistance amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Given the registration rate for this event, standing at nearly 900 persons, it's clear that there's no shortage of interest in this topic. Over the past few years, FAO North America and the Danish Embassy in Washington have partnered closely in co-hosting events such as this one, aimed at sharing knowledge and expertise on issues of mutual priority and concern with policymakers, thought leaders, practitioners, and other key stakeholders. Typically, these events are held at the beautiful Danish Embassy in Washington. However, in light of current circumstances, this is the best we can do. I would like to express our thanks in particular to Charles Venziel, Minister Counselor for Food, Agriculture, and Fisheries at the Embassy in Washington for all of his support in bringing today's event to fruition. Antimicrobials, antimicrobials rather, are essential for treating and preventing infections in humans, animals, and plants, and for enabling the fundamental and life-saving medical interventions. Although micro antimicrobials are vital to defend people, animals, and plants against infections, their misuse and or overuse can lead to their failure as microbes de develop resistance to these life-saving treatments, which can threaten the very foundations on which modern medicine and life is built. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic underscores the critical importance of effectively combating antimicrobial resistance. AMR does not recognize geographic or human or even animal borders. Therefore, addressing its rising threat requires an integrated, multi-sectoral, one health and food chain approach. To further explore these issues and the dynamics undergirding them, we have a highly distinguished cast of speakers lined up for you today. However, before proceeding with our formal program, there are a few important housekeeping items I'd like to cover. Firstly, I'd like to advise you that this event is being recorded. I would also like to vigorously encourage all of you to begin submitting questions to our speakers in the Zoom Q&A box at the bottom center of your screen. And as you do so, please specify which speaker your question is intended for. And please feel free to identify yourself by citing your name and organizational affiliation, if any. Due to time constraints, I will not be able to provide full and proper introductions for all of our very distinguished group of speakers. But in lieu of these, I urge you to look at the speakers' biographies, which will be posted in the Zoom chat box. Lastly, I would like to provide a brief outline of how our event will be structured today. In a moment, I will have the honor of inviting the Ambassador of Denmark to the United States, Ms. Lona Wisborg, and FAO Deputy Director General, Ms. Maria Helena Semedo, to offer welcoming remarks and to help frame our discussion. Thereafter, I will have the pleasure of giving the floor to Denmark's Minister of Health and Senior Citizens, Mr. Magnus Hoinicke, who will deliver a keynote address, which will help to further ground and contextualize our discussion today, drawing, of course, upon Denmark's highly successful efforts in this critically important area. We will then have a moderated discussion with a panel of five experts of the very first order. Immediately following the panel discussion, I will begin posing questions from you, our audience, to our speakers based upon your entries in the Zoom Q&A box. And then this will be followed by closing remarks from my colleague, Vimlendra Sharan, Director of the FAO Office for North America based in Washington, DC. We will endeavor to conclude our session promptly at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or at 5.30 p.m. in Rome and Copenhagen. For me, today's event represents one of those rare occasions when the professional collides with the personal. As a young man, I had the great fortune of studying abroad for a year in Denmark at the University of Copenhagen, a truly unforgettable experience. And so ever since then, I've had a very special affinity for Denmark and the Danes. And it is therefore my honor and my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Ms. Lona Wisborg, Ambassador of Denmark to the United States. Before assuming her current position as Ambassador of Denmark to the US at the Embassy in Washington, DC, Ambassador Wisborg 
served as State Secretary and Chief Operating Officer in the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ambassador Wisborg has also served as Ambassador to Denmark, to Spain from 2011 to 2015. The Ambassador has an extremely distinguished career with the Danish Foreign Service spanning over 25 years. And I urge you to look at her full biography in the Zoom chat box. Without further ado, Ambassador Wisborg, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom, and uh, good morning or good afternoon to all of you, depending on where you are. I'm very pleased to co-host um, today's event together with our partner, FAO. Um, I would have loved to have you all in residence, even though 900 participants might have stretched the facilities uh, to the limits. Uh, but let me just start uh, by thanking all of today's uh, speakers for taking the time to join us. Uh, in this important conversation on the threat of uh, AMR. I would like to say a special thanks uh, to the Danish Minister for Health, Magnus Heunicke, uh, for taking time to address us all today. Um, I know that you and your staff are very busy with the handling uh, of the COVID-19 situation back in, uh, in Denmark, even though fortunately things are looking much better there now. Uh, and I also know from your visit, um, in Washington DC last fall that you are personally very engaged in, uh, in the AMR agenda. And therefore we're very pleased to have you on the program today. Uh, so thank you very much for taking time. I would also like to uh, thank all of you who have joined today uh, and are listening in. We are looking forward to an active discussion uh, later on. The, um, the global COVID-19 pandemic has significantly significantly disrupted all our lives and it has claimed hundreds of thousands of lives uh, and the the global economy has taken a huge downturn uh, and we might not have seen the bottom of the curve yet. Um, the economic da uh, da hardship that we all face um, in the coming months and years will even further exacerbate the human suffering. Uh, millions are now unemployed uh, families are struggling to uh, make ends meet. The COVID-19 pandemic and the crisis it has thrown upon us all came almost out of nowhere. Well, yes, scientists had for years warned us about the coming of a pandemic uh, originating uh, from wildlife, but really no one saw it coming with such swiftness and such force. And the rapid rapid spread of COVID-19 has underscored both how global and how interconnected uh, the world has become in the last decades. But the spread of COVID-19 has also underscored how important the relationship is between human health, animal health, and the environment. Uh, and that goes as well for today's topic, the threat The crisis that uh, COVID-19 has created we believe is also an indicator of the magnitude of the crisis that AMR has the potential to develop into. Um, but the AMR crisis is also a crisis that we know is coming. Uh, and it's therefore also a crisis where we have the possibility to get ahead out of the curve um, if we act now and with prudent measures. It is a slow moving tsunami as the World Bank described it in a report from last year. Um, antimicrobials are at the core of our societies and has been for almost a century. Uh, they are an integral part of, of our modern medicine uh, and they have played a significant role in, in the development of our animal protein production and will continue to do so uh, in the years to come. They are essential for treating and preventing infections in humans, in, in animals uh, and in plants and for life-saving uh, medical uh, interventions. But although antimicrobials are vital uh, for us, the use, the misuse, and the overuse also lead to failure of the very same antimicrobials um, as bacteria adapt and develop uh, resistance towards the life-saving treatments. And as the COVID-19 uh, pandemic came from animals and jumped to humans, so do resistant bacteria arising either in humans, animals, or the environment. And they may spread from one host to another and from one country to another. 
AMR as COVID-19 does not recognize borders and can be transmitted from humans to animals and vice versa. We must therefore have a one health approach to combating uh, resistant bacteria. Denmark has a long uh, track record on One Health and on working on AMR. Um, we have, as, as many countries, benefited significantly uh, from antimicrobials, but we have also uh, realized its inherited danger. Tackling AMR in, uh, in Denmark was at first a mostly domestic issue, but also somewhat a Nordic and an EU issue. But with our own track record in mind, we became increasingly aware that much more was needed and that it had to be uh, fought outside our own borders and at the global level. And therefore the Danish government, uh, after consultation with partners such as the World Bank and um, CGIR, launched a new initiative back in 2018 uh, called ICARS or the International Center for Antimicrobial Resistance is on solutions. The main focus is on assisting low and middle income countries with cost effective and evidence based country specific solutions. But I'm sure that Minister Heunicke and later on scientific director at ICAS, uh, Dr. Robert Skov, will elaborate on that. The main point that I would like to make today is really that if we are to succeed in the fight against uh, resistant bacteria, it is very, very important that we adopt a One Health perspective, that we work in partnerships and on country specific solutions. And with today's lineup of panelists, uh, we have gathered speakers with insight and knowledge, both with a global perspective, FAO, World Bank and ICAS, but also country, uh, but also country representatives who can give us the local and practical perspective because AMR is a global threat, but it needs to be dealt with in a national and local context. And before I pass the floor back to you, Tom, uh, I would like to uh, thank very much our co-host FAO, the Embassy uh, of Denmark and the uh, FAO's liaison offices in North America have um, built a very strong partnership over the last three years. Uh, and thank you so much also to Wim Lendra for your leadership in this uh, and a big thank also to your excellent staff. You guys have once again made it possible for all of us to uh, home in on a very important issue. We have uh, a busy, busy schedule before us today, but also in the greater uh, scheme of things. So thank you and over to you, you, Tom. Excellent, thank you so much, Ambassador. I am now truly honored to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Maria Helena Semedo, Deputy Director General at FAO. Before taking up her current duties in 2013, Deputy Director General Semedo gained valuable experience and insights in Africa, first as FAO representative in Niger, then as Deputy Regional Representative for Africa and Sub-Regional Coordinator for West Africa. And prior to her international career, she worked as a leading economist for the Cabo Verde Ministry of Planning and Cooperation before becoming Secretary of State for Fisheries. And then in 1993, Minister for Fisheries, Agriculture, and Rural Affairs, the first ever woman minister in her country. After serving as Minister for Tourism, Transportation, and Marine Affairs, she became a member of parliament, a position she held until 2003. Deputy Director General Semedo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to all. I am very pleased on, on behalf of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations to welcome you all to this very timely webinar, as it has been said. I would like to thank uh, Magnus Heinrich, Minister of, for Health from Denmark, Ambassador Wiesborg, and the Danish Embassy in Washington, D.C., for their gr great collaboration in co-hosting this event with our colleagues FAO North America as, a, as well as for their strong partnership. A great welcome to all the panelists and participants and also to uh, all FAO colleagues. Denmark has been a long-standing 
a steadfast partner of Faust for 75 years. As you know, we're living this year, our 75th anniversary, meaning that Denmark has been a partner since the beginning, including in the critically important area of combating antimicrobial resistance. COVID-19 is teaching us many vital lessons, as Ambassador has said. For example, the importance of prevention and preparedness, or the crucial role of multilateral coordination among others. But more evident, evidently, COVID is showing us how a pathogen without treatment looks like, and this is what we will face in the near future if you do, do not tackle AMR with the urgent it deserves, meaning that is, is a silent tsunami, tsunami, as it has already been said. Urgency is of great importance. It also has been reported that bacterial co-infections are having significant impact on morbidity and mortality rates during the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, the COVID-19 crisis is warning us that while working to understand and control the current pandemic, it is crucial to prepare, to prepare for the wars and prevent any future pandemic caused by supper bugs. It's important to know the origin but I think most important now is to tackle the disease at source and avoid its repetition. We don't have a choice. We must limit the emergency and spread of antimicrobial resistance now and treat it as the emergency it is. Otherwise, a century of progress in health economic and development gains can, can, do, can be jeopardized within a generation time frame. As a driver of antimicrobial resistance lie in humans, animal, plants, food and environment, a sustained one health response is essential to engage and unite all stakeholders. We cannot have a related approach. The approach has to be integrated. The actions required to address AMR involve governments, pharmaceutical companies, health workers, private sector, farmers and agribusiness and financial institutions. We need good regulation and stewardship new treatment, accessible vaccines and diagnostics, regulation, sustainable management practices, surveillance and monitoring, and improve hygiene to prevent infection. We need more science. But above all, the crucial ingredient is country ambition and commitment. And this is where we should start, at the highest political level. This is what needs to be maintained and even reinforced amid the current pandemic. And I must say, because of it. EMR is high on the FAO agenda. Low and middle income countries are most vulnerable to the consequences of AMR, as they are disproportionately burdened by infectious diseases. Through an action plan on AMR, FAO works on the animal, both terrestrial and aquatic, and plant sectors. At the global data, at, at the global level, sorry, on data collection, surveillance, provision and guidelines and scientific evidence. 
at regional level and particularly with countries, helping them to develop and implement their national action plans on, on antimicrobial resistance. As we encourage countries to work across sector and ministries, as we said, it's not only a problem of health of agriculture, it's animal environment, we do alike. FAO is part of the long-standing partnership with the World Health Organization, OIE, and United Nations Environment, what we call the Tripartite Plus, that speaks at one voice and takes collective action to minimize the emergence and spread of AMR. And with this, I am very pleased to inform that building on the recommendation of the Interagency Coordination Group, ISG, established by the Secretary General on AMR, the United Nations Secretary General has requested the tripartite organization to convene a One Health Global Leaders Group of eminent and high-level political personalities to increase the high-level global political and advocacy momentum for the fight against AMR. We consider that awareness raising is important, not to say the starting point, and having a global group of personalities might help in this regard. The tackle of AMR lies in the highly dynamic complex and cross-sector nature. And because of that, regular evaluation of evidence on the emergency of AMR, the effectiveness of measures to address it, and the identification of future risk is crucial. For this purpose, we are currently in a process of consultation with countries for the establishment of, of an in the panel on evidence for action against AMR. It has been also recommended by the Interagency Coordination Group and is very important for scientific, scientific evidence. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to hearing and learning from Denmark, Vietnam and Zambia about their national experience and priorities around antimicrobial resistance during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as from colleagues from the International Center for Antimicrobial Resistance Solutions, the World Bank, and from my colleagues from FAO. I also wish to congratulate Denmark for hosting one of the five reference center on AMR, as well the United States. The COVID-19 pandemic, far from distracting us from the efforts to tackle AMR, should reinforce our determination, our cooperation, and keep us the sense of urgency. We need to act now, and we need to act together. And I thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Director General Semedo. It is now my honor to introduce Mr. Magnus Hoynicke, Denmark's Minister for Health and Senior Citizens. Previously, Minister Hoynicke served as Minister for Transport as well as Auditor of Public Accounts. And since 2005, he has been a member of the Danish Parliament for the Social Democratic Party. And formally, Minister Hoynicke also served as spokesperson on welfare, on municipal affairs, and on rural districts and islands, as well as on political affairs, transport, IT, and telecommunications. Without further ado, Minister Hoynicke, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, is it on? Excuse me, can you hear me right now? Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to address 
the AMR challenge in light of the COVID-19. First of all, allow me to express my gratitude to the FAO, Maria Helena Semedo, and to the Danish Embassy for organizing this event in what is indeed challenging times. It is important not to forget how AMR is still a threat, a threat that has become even more urgent in light of the COVID-19 crisis. And let me go directly to the core of the matter. With antimicrobial resistance, we are dealing with a global threat. What, what is described as a slow motion tsunami that is accelerating due to the COVID-19 virus. The pandemic has shaken our way of thinking about healthcare. And we are so used to relying on miraculous inventions like Alexander Fleming's penicillin made some 90 years ago. However, let's face it, it is time for us all to recall the declaration by the WHO from 2011 that said the world is on the brink of losing these miracle cures. On top of this existing AMR challenge, the COVID-19 pandemic has made a strong strategic and systematic global focus on AMR even more important. And like the coronavirus, AMR does not recognize country borders or the distinction between sectors. COVID-19 is currently challenging the entire world. It causes severe pressure on healthcare systems throughout the world with overcrowding in hospitals and healthcare facilities as a result. This in turn causes difficulties in compliance with important hygiene and prevention measures. And in addition, many patients admitted to hospitals receive antibiotics for the prevention and treatment of secondary bacterial infections, which in turn escalates the AMR challenge. Therefore, the pandemic clearly underlines that it will become even more essential to find cost-effective solutions to AMR. Hence the mission of ICARS. Denmark gives high priority to the fight against AMR. Therefore, we have been working hard to establish an independent international center for antimicrobial resistance solutions, that's ICARS, in collaboration with the World Bank and in partnership of the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research. Bodies at all levels, not least the WHO and FAO play an essential role in creating the policy framework for our common fight against AMR. But major knowledge gaps remain when it comes to translating policy into action and developing effective solutions, taking into account all aspects of the One Health approach. But there is an urgent need to provide practical guidance on the implementation of feasible solutions, especially in low and middle income countries. ICARS aims to help fill these gaps in an enhanced and targeted effort to develop such guidance. In closing, let me assure you that the Danish government now more than ever is fully dedicated to ICARS and to the global fight against AMR. The coronavirus reminds us of the dependence of public health on the availability of effective medicines. And we must remember that we are dealing with a kind of paradox here. On one hand, we all know how vital antimicrobials are to defend us against infections. But on the other hand, we know that misuse and overuse can lead to the failure of these life-saving treatments. In fact, it is with open eyes that we see how AMR can threaten the very foundations on which modern medicine is built. COVID-19 has 
pushed the urgency for global focus and for action now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Minister Hoynicker, for that excellent overview of both the challenges and the opportunities for combating AMR, particularly against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic. And thank you also for your leadership and Denmark's on this important issue. As we transition into the panel discussion segment of our event today, I would like to invite Berhe Takola to take the floor. Berhe is the director of the Animal Production and Health Division at FAO headquarters in Rome. And please um, visit the Zoom chat box for Berhe's full biography. Berhe, could you please tell us a bit about FAO's role and priorities in this space? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tom. Um, are you hearing me? Yes, very you well. Me? All right, thank you. Um, yeah, FAO, FAO's activities on uh, AMR, probably Mr. Meadow has explained it perfectly, but let me give you the bird's eye view of what FAO is doing both globally and locally. Uh, we first consider um, humans, because when you see the FAO global approach to antimicrobial resistance, it's a sort of multi-sectoral. Multi-sectoral in the sense, if you can see from the uh, run, uh, right hand, uh, left hand side, we consider human because we cannot ignore the importance of antimicrobial resistance has on millions of people. In particular, the uh, low income and uh, low and medium income countries uh, where the people's livelihood are very much dependent on their livestock and on their crop, which are and will be seriously affected by the antimicrobial resistance. Obviously, FAO considers animals, food and crop, as well as water, waste and environment as you can see, we don't leave any stone unturned. Here you can see every sector of the uh, FAO's interventions are addressed. On the other side, uh, if you see the FAO's multi-sectoral approach implies very strong on One Health. One Health direction uh, and it sets very basic common grounds on any kind of cooperation uh, in the enforced way. I will elaborate probably this further in the uh, next few minutes. Due to the cross-cutting nature, FAO internally has a very complex situation to deal with. As you can see, we have the cross-cutting uh, working group, and then uh, in the circle, you can see all the uh, relevant departments, divisions, and units who are part and parcel of the One Health approach on AMR. At FAO, we have the so-called working group on AMR, which we uh, tend to meet every week and uh, as a sort of all-inclusive way of approach. On the global collaboration approach, let me give you some uh, updates. In 2015, the uh, 60A's World Health Assembly agreed to have the national action plans where FAO and OIE contributed to the WHO uh, initiative. Then in 2017, the UN Secretary General established the Interagency Coordination Group, which Mr. Meadow was uh, just mentioning. And next year, after a year in May uh, 2018, the uh, three organizations signed a memorandum of understanding to uh, uh, create this initial tripartite work plan. And the multi-partner uh, uh, first hand was uh, established. In, in 2019, the IACG report to the UN Secretary General was endorsed, I mean, uh, presented, and then it was endorsed by the Secretary General. Immediately in 2019, was launched the multi uh, partners Trust Fund, MTF on AMR. Now, this is being led by the three 
organizations. September last year was the time where uh, the uh, uh, Joint Secretary, uh, Secretariat for AMR was established. And this year, the beginning of this year that uh, Ms. Amero just mentioned, uh, the uh, One Health Global Leaders Group was established and sent for approval to the Secretary General. We just received it a couple of days before the positive uh, response from the Secretary General. We are very happy. And now we are jumping to the last but not least uh, plan for 2020, which is the establishment of the independent panel. Now, what is the way forward? First, FAO's future uh, strategy will be focusing on the achievement of the current work to be more engaged based on One Health Initiative, expand the geographical coverage of the sample countries that we have already identified from 10 to 15 or 12 in the near future or, or uh, 20. And then apply lessons learned based on the best practice scaling up process. So one health approach is mandatory, not only important. And then the horizon scanning all the way, the, the value chain from the economic sustainability all the way to the livelihood. Increase the data availability. Data is very important. Whatever we do, if we don't measure it, then it's the time exercise. So big data are being expected. And this, without the support and collaboration of member states, won't go far. So we fully depend upon member states. Finally, to improve the antimicrobial use, when we say, please reduce the antimicrobial uh, use, it doesn't mean that we have to stop. But the prudent use of uh, antimicrobials is very important in the sector of food and agriculture. I thank you. If there are any questions, I will come back later on. Over to you, Tom. All right, thank you so much. That was an extremely useful presentation and, and set of slides and, and, and comments. And you've already touched upon this, but if I could, I'd like to ask you a two-pronged question uh, in hopes that you can elaborate a bit more on what you've already said. And the, the two-pronged question is, uh, what is FAO doing with uh, other international organizations to curb the threats linked to AMR globally? And how do you link those efforts um, around AMR in light of the current COVID-19 scenario? Thank you. Um, wait a minute. Am I muted? You hearing me? Yes, quite well. All right, thank you. Well, FAO cooperates with the uh, two key partners, OIE and WHO, as a tripartite. Back in 2015, the AMR Global Action Plan was developed, as I mentioned earlier, and adopted by the World Health Assembly. Together, as a tripartite, we launched the multi-partner uh, trust fund on, uh, on AMR in 2019. Now, FAO also closely cooperates with UN environment. FAO is uniquely positioned to bridge the multi-sectoral response to antimicrobial resistance at the human, animal, and environmental interface. As you can see, the scope of FAO's intervention is not limited to one sector. You go to WHO, they are just human health sector. You go to OIE, they are almost animal health, but limited to the standards. If you come to FAO, the lion's share of the burden is in FAO. In the crop, we have all the uh, antimicrobials, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. In the animal path, we have the uh, antihelmetics, antibiotics. You go to the water and land, to the forestry. So almost, I can say, more than 70% of the uh, burden in the antimicrobial resistance scenario remains at the agricultural sector, so at FAO role. Now, how can we uh, link this one to the uh, COVID-19? 
COVID-19 rarely kills alone. Many die from the secondary bacterial infection, partly due to the uh, already existing high level of antimicrobial in the animal, in the human, or in the plant. That's why we say AMR is a slow moving pandemic than COVID-19. In addition to the expressions like the slow motion uh, tsunami, we call it also uh, to be um, uh, a timing bomb scenario. We don't see it killing like the uh, infect or contagious disease does, but after 10 years, we are going to pay it expensive if we don't react today. So we must not only try to fight COVID-19, but also prevent the next pandemic. This is one of the priority of FAO. We have the so-called uh, FAO next pandemic, prevent next pandemic. This could well be uh, a multi-resistant subvarg. The COVID-19 scenario teaches us that it is better to prevent than respond. Over to you. Excellent. Some very important cautionary words from Berhe, and we look forward to hearing more from you in a little while during the question and answer segment of our discussion. I would now like to introduce Robert Scope, Scientific Director at the International Center for Antimicrobial Resistance Solutions in Denmark. Robert, could I ask you to please tell us a bit about ICARS and its role and its priorities? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, could you please uh, put on my slides? Um, but first of all, I would like to, on behalf of ICARS, I would like to thank both the FAO and the Danish ambassador, uh, Mrs. Visbor, for inviting us to this important webinar. So as all of you know, that the national action plans for AMR mitigation are in place in most countries. However, implementation of these are challenging, especially in low and middle income countries, and, and there are significant implementation, implementation gaps in most of these uh, countries, yes. Um, this leads to an increasing burden due to AMR leading to both rising social and economic impact in these countries. There is thus an urgent need for the development of sustainable context-specific solutions to advance implementation of AMR mitigation. Uh, please, the next slide. To uh, advance implementation, there is a need to use intervention and implementation research in order to develop solutions that are both evidence-based, cost-effective, context-specific, and what's really important is that as AMR do not respect sectors, AMR mitigation require a One Health approach and solutions must, in addition to this One Health approach, have to be cross-sectoral and holistic. Um, by, by taking such an approach, we together will be able to close the gaps between technical solutions and practice. And what you see here on the right is the four pillars of ICARS uh, under a One Health hat with implementation research, translating evidence, ev advocacy, and capacity building. And next slide, please. ICARS, as uh, mentioned by Minister Heunicke, is a novel, independent, and international center initiated by Denmark. The center uh, is still in its uh, inception and is right now seeking fun founding partners as well as associated partners, uh, which I will show you in a second. ICARS expects to become independent from the Danish government in 2021. And the present status of ICARS is that we have signed an MOU with Vietnam on the two first demonstration uh, projects, one in Pangasius aquaculture, where we will, by AMU reduction, will lead to both AMR reduction as well as better food safety. The other one is on pig production, where we want to minimize the use of colistin. 
uh, which is one of the most important drugs for broad um, uh, resistant gram negative bacteria. We are also in close negotiations with Georgia, where we have a, now a, a, an agreement for a, both in the human as well, as well as in the veterinary sector to make a um, antibiotic stewardship project there. And furthermore, in three African countries, these have sent expression of interest to partner with ICARS on developing new um, projects together with us. And um, the next slide, please. So in order to achieve all of this, we need potential partnerships with a lot of different countries and organizations, both countries as donors as well as recipients, international organizations in order to align all the agendas that is there, including with WHO, FAO, OIE, and UNEP. Um, we also look into a partnership with national and international networks, such as Cedric, um, Apua, and the CG system, uh, the latter, which we already have a, an agreement uh, with, and are setting up a, a close collaboration there uh, with the centers uh, of the CG system. We also do uh, align with uh, existing initiatives in order not to duplicate, such as the UK Fleming Fund, the GAMBRIF, the DART P, as well as the Joint Program Initiative for AMR. Furthermore, with research institutions who already do a great job on this, such as Raboot uh, and Imperial College London and INSERM. And finally, we also believe that it is important to involve the private sector, both diagnostics and well as the food industry, uh, as well as other private partners. So with these uh, words here, I thank you and take any questions. Take specific cost-effective solutions in these countries that uh, is evidence-based so that we are changing from believing into really evidence in, in these matters here, because this is crucial for the countries to actually be able to implement the AMR mitigations that is so nicely expressed in their national action plans. And it's exactly by being this solution development partnership uh, that ICARS want in very close collaboration where the LMICs is stating their own major challenges and in a close collabor collaboration with these countries, we will then develop such re uh, research that will provide them with the evidence that it is actually possible to do AMR mitigation in a both cost-effective and sustainable um, effort. So I think this is where ICARS really can make the big difference is on the ground, in the country, with the country uh, uh, doing it. Excellent, thank you so much, Robert. Now moving on to Zambia, I would like to introduce our, our next speaker, Otrida Capona, who's lab scientist as well as the AMR National Focal Point and coordinator at the Zambia National Public Health Institute. Otrida, could you please describe for us the current situation in Zambia in relation to AMR, as well as any priorities or perhaps even lessons learned you might wish to highlight for us? Thank you very much, Tom. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, as a country, we took a multi-sectoral approach um, through a consultative process of all line ministries and cooperating partners and developed a 10-year plan that was launched in 2017 by um, permanent secretaries from the line ministries. Um, our national action plan is currently in year um, three of um, implementation. Um, the implementation of our national action plan has come with its um, challenges and lessons learned. 
uh, through support of um, our cooperating partners, WHO, OLIE, FAO, we have heard CSE and React Africa come on board. Uh, we have held some regional and international meetings where we um, have shared experiences and challenges with regards to NAP implementation. Um, you will agree with me that implementation of national action plans on AMR is an intensive capital project that requires resources and these are financial, human, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, like most African countries, uh, Zambia shares uh, such challenges, um, including um, inadequate enforcement of regulations um, that surround use of antimicrobials. Um, also, I would say that the response uh, to AMR um, is not equal to the level of the problem that we're dealing with. Um, why do I say so? Again, like most African countries, I think addressing AMR or spearheading implementation of the National Action Plan uh, seems to be an added responsibility for most um, people in the coordinating committee, um, as well as for the national focal points. So they have sort of a full-time job, like I'm a lab scientist, I'm expected to play my role as lab scientist, uh, from morning to the time I know cope, but I also need to find time to, you know, spearhead and coordinate implementation of the National Action Plan. So that seems to be um, a, a very big challenge um, that we, we have faced. Um, despite the challenges, uh, we have made some remarkable strides with regards to implementation. We have had a lot of awareness raising activities because uh, we believe people need to know what the problem is and, and, and what their role is in addressing um, the problem. We have had radio uh, programs, we have had uh, campaigns, we have engaged uh, the community through health promotions, and we have also engaged the media to see how best we can package uh, AMR-related messages for the general public to understand what the problem is and uh, what their role is in, in addressing this problem. Uh, in addressing objective number two, uh, uh, in our national action plan that is the same as the one in the global action plan, we are working on strengthening the um, capacities of our laboratories to do AMR surveillance. And we feel this is important because we need to be able to generate local data, actionable data that will inform uh, policy and action. We are also focusing on infection prevention and control, as well as our, our biosecurity. And these interventions, again, are across sectors. So um, uh, the, the importance of infection prevention and control, you agree with me again, when it comes to addressing AMR cannot be overemphasized. And so that's one other focus area. Objective number four, optimization of antimicrobial use. We, we have received tremendous support again from React Africa that has helped us develop an, an antimicrobial stewardship policy. And we are currently um, 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 piloting antimicrobial stewardship programs in our health facilities. The idea is to see how these programs work and then we can uh, possibly roll them out uh, to the rest of the country. Additionally, last year with the support of CSC, we worked on a roadmap to phase out use of critically important antimicrobials for um, um, non-therapeutic purposes in the animal health sector. So those are some of the uh, um, activities that we've been implementing um, at national level with regards um, addressing antimicrobial resistance and um, implementing our national action plan. Uh, we are not where we would have loved to be because of the challenges I, I, I earlier highlighted, obviously human capacity, limited laboratory capacity and all that. But I want to give us a part on the back. I think we, we, we have made that one step to contributing to addressing AMR. Thank you. Excellent. And if I may say so, it, it definitely sounds to me as though that pat on the, the back is, uh, is merited. This might be a bit of a, a big question, but if I could, could I ask you to try to describe for us perhaps two of the most important lessons you've learned uh, in your response to AMR in the, the Zambian context? Thank you very much for that question, Tom. 
I think the most important, um, one of the most important lessons we have learned is prioritization of our national action activities in our national action plan. When we were developing our plan, we had so many things that we put in there. Um, uh, we want to do this in year one under this objective year two or through to 10. But along the process, we realized that it is not possible for us to be able to implement all those activities. And so we had to prioritize for optimal use of the resources and also greater impact. Um, this is an activity we did with support from other countries um, in, in a regional meeting and uh, in, in partnership with Center for Science and Environment, where we had to relook at our national action plan and prioritize and see which activities can we effectively implement with the little resources that we have that would have greater impact. Um, also, it's about meeting the evolving needs and um, emerging challenges such as the COVID. So we realign our national action plan to suit what is currently obtaining and see how best we can utilize the resources. I think another important lesson that we have learned um, is the value of um, collaborative multi-sectoral partnership. I will tell you that when we began this journey um, in developing our national action plan through implementation, we didn't have a budget line in the national budget uh, because the budget had already been passed. But because of the collaborative effort and partnerships that we forged, uh, we, we are where we are today. We were able to develop our national action plan and were able to implement um, certain activities um, in our national action plan. Um, additionally, I think another lesson I should share is that not we've come to learn that not everything requires money. Um, we, we have learned to ride to mainstream AMR activities in already existing programs such as IPC, WASH and all. And, and, and I think uh, we have realized that that is important uh, um, also for sustainability, uh, for sustainability's sake. So those are some of the lessons that we, we have learned in uh, implementing our national action plan. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you so much. So you said not everything requires money, but I think you'd agree that it, it certainly helps. And yes, I would now like to... Definitely, definitely, yeah. And as such, I would now like to invite an economist to join our discussion. Julian Lampietti serves as Global Engagement Manager at the Agriculture and Food Global Practice of the World Bank. Julian, welcome. Could you please describe for us how the bank approaches AMR, as well as its role and some of its current priorities in this space? Thank you, Tom, uh, very much. And uh, greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And thank you very much to FAO for hosting this event, as well as the Danish government. So um, I would also like to start by thanking my uh, friend and colleague, Frank Bert, who uh, is the author of the World Bank report on the subject and uh, was the one who came up with this fabulous imagery that many of you have referred to uh, about a silent tsunami. And uh, I'm gonna go wildly off script with the presentation that Frank prepared for me, which was very, sort of uh, Louis XIV uh, linear, uh, beautiful piece of work, uh, but I'm gonna work on imagery uh, and try to impart that to you. And we have a very complex relationship with uh, antimicrobials. And uh, this is a story about how much, uh, how too much of a good thing is a really bad thing, uh, right? So how much, too much treatment of AMR actually is really damaging to us. It's also a story about how an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And uh, that's really where the economist perspective comes into this. And our norms and behavior have a lot to do with this. The institutions around us, be they formal or markets or whatever, have a lot to do with this. And the trends that are going on, on around us have a lot to do with this. Now, I'm gonna tell you this story because in addition to working at the World Bank, I'm a farmer. Okay, and I raise uh, cattle uh, right here in rural Virginia. And uh, a couple of years ago, I had a severe pink eye problem with my cattle. So most of you probably know what pink eye is. Your kids have had it. Maybe not your cows like mine. Uh, so pink eye is a bacterial infection. 
And I did what any good farmer would do when his cows get pink eye, is I called the vet. And the vet said, oh, you can go and buy this certain product. And so I chased down my cows and I sprayed the product in their eyes. And of course, uh, two weeks later, the pink eye came back. And then I went back to the vet and got a stronger product. And this cycle went on and on and on for weeks. And you know, the cows were going blind and so on, and it was ruining my product. And it was taking me a huge amount of time and it wasn't getting any better and it was getting more expensive. So I did a little research and I figured out that the first thing I needed to do is redirect the cows so that they weren't entering any of the waterways. So I fenced them out of the waterways, clean water, really important for good health of my animals. Second thing I started doing is I started rotating them around in different pastures. That reduced the amount of cow manure that was right next to them where the flies were breeding that were spreading the pink eye. It also improved their nutrition dramatically. Stronger animals, less susceptible to pink eye. And third, I started spreading natural predators around that would attack those flies. So I built swallow boxes so the tree swallows could come and I uh, I uh, helped uh, create an environment for natural wasps that would attack the larvae of the flies that were spreading the disease. And after doing all of these things and improving these management practices, boom, I had a dramatic reduction in the amount of pink eye in my cattle. Now, my story, going back to my job at the World Bank, is that investing in the SDGs and the infrastructure and achieving all of these things is a really, really good investment to preventing AMR. And it's not just about how we use the drug and which drug we use and trying to prevent people from using the drugs, but it's creating the right environment for sustainability and an environment where healthy people aren't getting sick and therefore not needing the drugs. So don't focus just on the problem, focus on the environment around you and let's take advantage of this huge opportunity that has been created by COVID-19 to build the system back better and make the right investments in the infrastructure and in the SDGs so that we can mitigate this problem through a systemic approach. Thank you very much. Excellent, thanks very much, Julian. Uh, appreciated uh, traveling with you as you, uh, as you told us that story. And, and I think you've done an excellent job of making the economic case for uh, investing in combating AMR. Um, but I was wondering if you could briefly give us an example or two of how this AMR lens would work in practice uh, at the World Bank in terms of the bank's approach. Yeah, great, Tom. Thank you very much for that question. So. Um, the World Bank has about uh, $250 billion worth of uh, investments out there. And about 25% of that is in uh, agriculture, water, health, nutrition, and population. And those projects can all be strung together to get just the kind of systemic change and right operating environment that I was talking about. So if you look, uh, for example, in Africa, we have a, uh, East Africa Public Health uh, Laboratory Network project that's looking at tuberculosis and investing in monitoring systems. And then we have a, a regional pastoralism support project, which is investing in uh, veterinary systems. And then we have various agriculture projects that are investing in climate smart agriculture, better nutrition for animals, and so on. And when you start combining those things together, they can achieve more than each individual piece. And so this is really a story about how can we at the World Bank use a lens to look at some of these diseases and create a stronger, better underlying environment that will prevent them from occurring and actually mitigate the need for their treatment. Thanks very much, Julian. That's, uh, I think that's a very good description of how we can maximize impact and achieve scale. I would now like to move on to our colleague from, from Vietnam to hear about the Vietnam experience in, in this regard, uh, and also hear from someone who's also had the good fortune of living and studying in Denmark. Ms. Hoang Bui 
is the head of the Department of Food Microbiology and Molecular Biology at the National Institute of Nutrition in Vietnam. Hong, could you tell us a bit more about how these issues are playing out in Vietnam and about the Vietnamese approach to and priorities surrounding AMR? Yeah. Hi, John. Thanks. Good, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. First, I'd like to thank for American officials and also Venice Embassy to host these activities. And as the John mentioned, uh, I would like to share some perspective about the AMR uh, in Vietnam right now. Can you see our slide here? Not yet. Not yet. Can you put on my? Yes. Now we now we see it. Okay. Yeah. So for uh, our Uh, in Vietnam, the National Action Plan against AMR was issued in the year 2013 and extended in the year 2017 for agriculture and livestock. And these activities led by the Ministry of Health. And uh, after issue the National Action Plan, the government also implemented the eight memoir of the multi stakeholder engagement to combat AMR in Vietnam, which one uh, like the commitment on the apply the one health concept to fight against AMR in Vietnam. And as a one a pillar in the AMR combat, AMR surveillance is performed in the healthcare system. But right now, the system was established in the 16 hospitals and now it's extend more in the old country. But in animal health system, uh, there are no in national surveillance on bacterial classes, disease in livestock and aquaculture. And right now we need, and also I would like to note that uh, the year 2020 is also the time we revised uh, our previous uh, national action plan, where you can see the renewing one to reflect, more reflect national need and priority compared to the first uh, one version, which is strong driver by the WHO, FAO and other counterparts. And have some strong Can you share this one? No. Yep. Yeah. And here I will have to talk about the, some. Uh, challenges we face to when we do the uh, combat to the AMR and AMU in Vietnam. Uh, yeah, uh, in Vietnam, we have a high level uh, of the risk until by microbiome resistance in animal and human health setting and pose a significant burden. We found the high level of contamination against the ESB E. coli, cholestine, and quinolone, about the more than 50% in the human and in the uh, animal health and also in the environment. But still, the social economic costs are currently unknown, and even the knowledge in the economic impact is likely to have a strong, important influence the policy maker, how they prioritize and effort to fund the combat, uh, the AMR. And also, another challenge we face to here is data for AMU in human animal are extremely challenged. Uh, we have, don't have any central registration or population of the data on AMU. Now the government is a support for with the Fleming Fund Country Grant support to establish the data on AMU. And it is very important in the situation because the antimicrobiome import into Vietnam has no production as raw material taking part. Uh, and also, in the average, Vietnamese has a high use and consumption of the antimicrobials. The cell medication, unregulated access, and irration prescription are common in the both human and animals. Take care. Recently, uh, we have a new circulator that will only allow the 
antimicrobial in the use in the livestock based on prescription has been developed uh, by Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development with support by Danish government. And the one thing I would like to mention here is, is the quality of the uh, human and veterinary medicine, which often irregular quality. And in some uh, products, there are some compounds are not declared in the label. And uh, based on the situation, we would like to summarize in some prior future priority for the MI in Vietnam. The first thing, as you know well, so currently, uh, National Action Plan mentioned about seven solution groups to combat AMR, and the surveillance is the one is the most important one. So for us, in the near future, strength and cooperative, a surveillance network to detect outbreak and monitor strength is the uh, first selection. Uh, include the cap lab capacity, include the data management and training, and data to research and result policy. And in the surveillance, it's current priority by the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. It's existing in the National Action Plan, and also we need to focus, focus by the Fleming Fund, USCDC, and other support initiatives. Uh, we also are focused on the uh, translation and research and surveillance data into policy and the action and change. Uh, this one, I think, is the initiative and could be focused on the new revised uh, national action plan and also uh, what uh, ODI fund project should be focused on, uh, focused on should be uh, clarified in the new, new future. And for the second uh, solution for the to combat to AMR in the near future, we would like, I, I think it would be very important is in intervention activities for all the healthcare system, for the community, and also for livestock and aquaculture farm. Uh, as you know, Vietnam and other Southeast Asian countries were identified as the hub of AMR, and there are a number of research of ARMU in Vietnam, uh, resulting of finding data on AMR in Vietnam. Yes, we recognize that research is important, but I believe that the Vietnam also needs the intervention and solution that context specifically and can make the change in practice. Uh, and we, we think that the strong commitment are needed from government, from public and private sector to combat and reduce AMR effectively in the, in the near future. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Excellent. Thank you so much, Huang. You, you touched upon a lot of the challenges associated with making improvements and, and in terms of prevention in this space. I was wondering if you could very briefly, perhaps in a minute or less, describe for us a bit more some of the challenges associated with uh, promoting and advancing evidence and research-based policies. Okay, great. Thanks for your questions. Uh, yeah, during the uh, career, some uh, project here in Vietnam, we learned about the, the challenge about the how to engage the research result to the policy maker. And the issue we mentioned about the several times repeatedly among the researcher, among the research working group. And we believe that we need more uh, on right now, we need more opportunity uh, for the research group to work together with the policy maker from beginning of the every uh, project where we develop the proposal and we can get uh, receive more uh, input from the policy maker and where after that our reason could be applicable for them. And also in, we, we let the connect for research group officially. Uh, so we can know each other more clearly. We can engage our result, our activities to make the whole picture for the currently situation in the country and also to combat to combine make the very strong um, evidence uh, base which we can use for the policy um, advocacy advocate yeah Thanks. excellent thanks so much so this this concludes uh, the panel discussion segment of our program and I'd now like to transition into the question and answer segment and if you've been following the question and answer box and the, the chat box you'll you'll know that there's been quite a lot of activity, an explosion of, of questions, really. And uh, I guess the Zoom equivalent to heads nodding in agreement to a lot of what of our 
what our excellent speakers have said. If I could, I'd like to direct our first question to Deputy Director General Semedo. And this comes from the UK from Neil Forey. And Neil's question is, we'd like to know what can be done to ensure One Health remains a priority once this pandemic is over. Deputy Director General Semedo, the floor is yours. I, I believe uh, we have been working in uh, One Health approach even during the, the pandemic because if you see needs a uh, one health approach that we have animal and uh, environment all together and this is what what FAO is doing and will continue to do uh, in order to to work together during COVID and also having a global approach to antimicrobial resistance. I don't think it we need to to be after the pandemic, but throughout the pandemic also, uh, the One Health approach is important for the organization. And we are working with the other UN agencies to tackle the disease at risk. And this is what, and how we can have better solutions to reduce the use, abuse, or misuse of antibiotics in order of a healthy environment, a healthy human and animal. Excellent. Thank you so much, Deputy, Deputy Director General. Thank you very much. I would now like to um, pose a question from the audience to Robert Sko. And this question comes to us from Chile, from Costanza Vergara. And Costanza writes, in, in many countries, international organizations are putting their efforts in to create integrated surveillance programs, uh, but there are still gaps in the other objectives. And Costanza's question to you, Robert, is what do you think are the key objectives uh, for the global action plan that countries must fulfill before uh, they can start implementing integrated surveillance on, on AMR? So thank you very much for, for this uh, very good question. So one of the big issues here is to actually have a cross-sector collaboration here. Otherwise, it is difficult to make a, a true One Health um, surveillance. So I think this is one of the crucial things here is to start to work together between the different sectors here and, and to understand each other and, and how um, AMU and AMR is interlinked between the different sectors. Apart from this, I think that obviously there is a, a number of other, you know, more technical issues that needs to be in place, uh, such as um, access to, to strains, access to, to good uh, laboratory practices, and, and that may sound very trivial, but it's, it's not as trivial as it sounds. It, it is, in fact, in many countries, a problem to get uh, access to, um, to specimens, especially from, from the agricultural sector. So I think this is a very important thing to build on and, and to, to build up. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. And if I could, um, I would like to, building on that question, uh, briefly ask Otrida to respond to a question we've received from Sarah Jerving, and it, it regards uh, the importance of surveillance with AMR. If you could talk uh, very briefly, perhaps in a minute or less, about some of the uh, ongoing activities in this area in, in Zambia. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you, Sarah, for the question. So I think, AMR surveillance is important for generation of evidence. We keep talking about having local actionable data that we inform policy um, and action in the diverse um, um, and changing AMR landscape. So we need surveillance to be able to generate the data. Um, some of the activities that we are doing or the efforts towards uh, increasing our surveillance um, First, let me mention that we have developed an integrated AMR surveillance strategy that outlines how we'll do surveillance across the sectors. We have developed standard operating procedures for the surveillance sites. 
Additionally, we've embarked on a mentorship program, and this is meant to build and develop skills among our lab people. So the mentorships cover sample collection, uh, culture, identification, antimicrobial susceptibility testing, all the way to data interpretation. Um, in the labs, in the human and animal health sectors that are within the network. We are also, with um, the, the, uh, the help of uh, cooperating partners and uh, the Fleming Fund Country Grant, we have um, started equipping these laboratories uh, with certain pieces of equipment that are needed for them to do the work. Additionally, we have also done an integration of our data management system. I think it's the first of its kind with the help of FIND we have developed an integrated data management system that is able to collect, collect, and collect data from, from, from the different data sources within the sectors. So some of, those are some of the efforts that we, we have put in place at national level. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're, we're almost running out of time, but to maximize the time we have left, I would like to pose a question to our other three panelists and ask each of them to respond if possible in about 30 seconds or left because uh, or less, because after that, I'd like to very quickly go around and ask each of our speakers to give their key takeaway message to the audience. But the question here, and I'll ask uh, Berhe to, to start very briefly, uh, and then Julian, and then Huang. The question comes from the FAO Ethiopia office, and uh, the question is, what should be done or can be done to address the AMR situation in developing countries, particularly in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, what more can we do? I know you all touched upon this to some extent in your remarks, but perhaps in about 30 seconds uh, or so, you could each expand a bit more on that question. Uh, please, Berhe. Good, thank you very much. Um, as uh, appreciated kind of question, because when we say our uh, national intervention is when we have the country intervention, it's not a generic one. It's more of a tailored, approach that what we are in the US, in the uh, European countries and the developing countries is completely different. As we know, there, as there is excess use of antimicrobials, there is also lack of access to antimicrobials. So how best we can narrow this too is what we are dealing with country like Ethiopia and other countries. It's not to avoid or not to use antimicrobials. It's not an issue of reducing antimicrobials. It's rather to increase in those kind of countries because the antimicrobials we have in those countries are either counterfeit, expired, or you know with less quality. So go for quality and for the right one. So increasing that means just focusing on the prudent use of antimicrobials, not to ban them. Thank Excellent. Thank, thank you so much, Berhe. Over to you, Julian. And once again, the question is, what more can we be doing to support developing countries uh, in AMR, especially uh, in the, the COVID context? And if you could, in about 30 seconds or less, please. Thank you very much, Tom. And so uh, the message is the same. If we can help a country like Ethiopia improve nutrition, improve the quality of, uh, improve nutrition for people, improve uh, nutrition for animals, if we can uh, provide clean water for people, for animals, we can uh, make sure that when these antimicrobial uh, drugs are used, they're used in the right place and at the right time and not overused, and thus we reduce the uh, occurrence of resistance. So do the SDGs. Thank you. Plain and simple. Thank you, Julian. Uh, over to you, Huang, please, in, in 30 seconds or less, please. Uh, also, I agree with the idea from the both uh, presenter before, and also from the uh, uh, we also come from the um, developing country somehow. And we think that, of course, for the sustainable activities, we need some specific uh, measures, uh, activities to reduce AMR to come back to AMR. Uh, but in the mid for the timing, also some uh, unspecific um, measures could be used to reduce. Uh, the risk of the uh, AMR in the community, in the human and also uh, animal health, uh, something like the uh, un, uh, practice, hygiene practice, it could help to reduce bacteria in general and also in AMR. Is it come from our study? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Wang. 
And I apologize in advance for making this request of our excellent speakers, but I think we should try. We, we, we only have about five or so minutes left, and I, I want to make sure we have uh, time for our closing remarks. But I'd like to ask, if I may, uh, Ambassador Wisborg and Deputy Director General uh, Semedo, if, uh, if they have any final takeaway messages that they'd like to, to leave us with in, in, say, 30 seconds or less, if possible. Thank you, Tom. Well, uh, you know, I have just really enjoyed uh, listening to the speakers. Uh, I think it just shows us how timely this webinar was and how important this issue is and, and even more important now in the light of, of COVID-19. And just pleased to, to see how many uh, important uh, resources are put into this. We have to we have to maintain our focus on this important issue, even though it is a, a slow mo moving tsunami. Um, the more important it is to not um, sort of lose track of it. So um, I'm very encouraged and I think a lot of good forces are working on this and uh, I, I just appreciate everybody taking time to, uh, to join. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Deputy Director General Semedo, over to you. Thank you and uh, I also agree uh, with um, the uh, Ambassador. But something I would like to, to stress is the importance to act at country level. I think the example of Zambia and Vietnam shows that if you, we need to have a change, it, we, we have to start from the country. Is where we need to invest. We need to invest in changing of attitude, in how we can increase surveillance, how we need data, and how we can have access to, to other medicines in a way that we don't misuse the antibiotics. But the fight is also at the global level. And all of us, we are called upon in finding uh, accessible solutions and bringing more science and to see how we can also take into consideration that we need to livelihoods of people is, is important. How many people they live on um, animal, but our health is one: human, animal, and environment. And they have been they have to be seen as cross sector and interlinked. This is my takeaway for this. We need to be all together and to come up with the global solutions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Deputy Director General. And I regret that we don't have more time because this is obviously a conversation that we could continue for quite some time and, and one that re we really must continue. And there are many excellent questions that, that we just simply don't have the time to get to. But what I would like to tell our audience is that we will share these questions and comments with all of our speakers and endeavor to do our best to, to respond to them. So apologies to anyone whose questions we did not have time to address. It, it's now my pleasure to introduce my FAO colleague, Vimlinger Sharon, who is the director of FAO's Liaison Office for North America in Washington, DC, a position he assumed in December 2016 to offer us some closing remarks. Vimlinger, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Excellencies, Minister Magnus, Poenika, Minister for Health and Senior Citizens from Denmark, Ambassador Lone Wisborg, Ambassador of Denmark to the United States, Deputy Gen Director General FAO, Ms. Maria Helena Samedo, all our distinguished panelists and participants for being with us today and sharing your valuable insights on global and national actions underway to tackle the scourge of antimicrobial resistance. Over the past hour and a half, we have all heard some insightful thoughts on the importance of combating antimicrobial resistance, as well as the global and country experience in tackling it, both in terms of achievements thus far and the existing gaps. A ticking time bomb, a silent tsunami, or a pandemic in waiting. Call it whatever you may, AMR is a very, is a very present reality in all parts of the world, in developing and developed countries, in rural and urban areas, in hospitals, on farms, and in communities. If we fail to address this problem quickly and comprehensively, antimicrobial resistance will make 
providing high quality universal health coverage extremely difficult, will undermine sustainable food production and put the sustainable development goals in jeopardy. We learned that it is possible to reduce the resistance, but it will not be easy. It will require long-term commitment from everyone in this room and outside. We will need the deep engagement, cooperation, and coordination of several sectors and sustained financing. Sadly, these elements are not present in full measure today. So what are my takeaways from today's, take, takeaways from today's discussions? Very briefly, three takeaways. First, we have traveled a long distance together and we must all celebrate our achievements so far. We now understand that international cooperation is imperative in getting stronger by the day. The Tripartite Plus or the One Health Global Leaders Group or going forward the ICARs established by Denmark are living examples of the growing international collaboration. Working together, the international community has agreed and invested in a common approach to antimicrobial resistance, though more will need to be done. As a panelist from Zambia, Otrida said, we are not where we would have loved to be, but we must give ourselves a pat on the back for the work done so far. And I couldn't agree more. My second takeaway from the discussions today is that the journey ahead is long and arduous. We must all commit to press on and ensure that our understanding and concern for AMR feeds into policies, programs, and actions that will deliver results. There are bound to be multiple challenges in implementing our commitments, especially financial, but together we have to find a way out. My third and final takeaway is the extremely, it's, is to keep ourselves accountable, whether we are UN organizations, national governments, private sector or civil society, we all must commit to regular accountability. This is necessary for all of us, irrespective of our organizations. We must remain focused on the agenda and ensure that all roads lead to One Health. As Julian mentioned, we need to work on the entire environment around AMR. And as he simply put it, do the SDGs. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, celebrate our achievements, commit to the work ahead of us, and keep ourselves accountable. These are the three takeaways for me. I hope you can too take these messages home and rededicate yourself to a healthier and more secure future. Thank you once again for joining this webinar today. Before I end, I must place on record my sincerest gratitude to Embassy of Denmark and Ambassador Wurzburg for the wonderful partnership that has evolved between the Danish Embassy here and the FA North America office. A special shout out to Charles Benzel, Minister Councillor for Food, Agriculture and Fisheries at the Embassy, and Tom Pesek, our Senior Liaison Officer at FAO North America, who have worked tirelessly to organize today's event. Needless to say, none of this would have been possible without the active support of our IT team led by James Codero and a communication team led by Florin Dora and Adi Mohammed. A big thank you to all of you. With that, we have come to the end of our webinar today. Have a good day, good night, wherever you are, and remember to join us at all our future webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you.